This is our ninth annual memorial service for our Gold Star Parents event. And we are honored to be partnered with the Blue Star Moms in hosting this very special event. We are here to remember and pay tribute to the sons and daughters of you Gold Star Parents. Your loved ones died serving our country. And there are others here with us this morning to show their support to you Gold Star Parents. And I want to thank them for joining us. You know, I stand before you as a former commander of Marines in combat, a father, a grandfather, and I am so humbled as I contemplate the sacrifices that you and your families have made. It is not natural for parents to outlive their children. There are simply no words to convey the depth of your loss. When Justin Hunt of Wildemere, California, first tried to join the Marine Corps, the recruiters didn't have a scale big enough to weigh him. Hunt was large, but not completely out of shape. A dozen trophies in his living room attested to his high school accomplishments in baseball, wrestling, and football. Still, he wasn't Marine fit. The recruiters estimated that the six-footer weighed as much as 390 pounds, though they couldn't be sure because the scale only went up to 350. Turned down by the Army and the Navy, Justin Hunt went to the Marine Corps recruiting office. But rather than turn him away, the Master Sergeant asked him if he was willing to work out and lose weight. They gave a diet to his mother, low carbo, high protein, no pasta, potatoes, french fries, or junk food. The master sergeant banged on the family door every morning at 7 o'clock for morning runs and workouts. From 390, Justin Hunt got down to 207 pounds, just two pounds below the maximum allowed for his height for acceptance into the Marine Corps boot camp. During boot camp, recruit Hunt lost another 30 pounds and told his mother he wanted to become a drill instructor. His proud parents were present when he graduated from Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego and proudly marched on the parade field in his dress uniform. Justin Hunt deployed to Iraq in February of 2004. Five months later, he died in combat in An Albar province, a victim of insurgents. At the young Marine's funeral, a reporter asked his mother, Debbie, who had adopted the young man as well as her four other children. They asked his mother, Debbie, aren't you disappointed your son didn't get to lead a full life? And she said, no. Although I'm sorry to lose my son, he achieved his lifetime goal. He lived long enough to wear the uniform of the United States Marine Corps. And so have your illustrious sons and daughters they have achieved the high goal and honor of wearing the uniforms of the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and National Guard. For them, let us pray. These two young men are not your loved ones, but they're exactly like your loved ones. They're cut from the same bolt of cloth and have the same kind of steel on their backs. On the 22nd of April, 2008, two Marine battalions, the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, the walking dead from Vietnam fame, 
and the 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines were switching out in a place called Ramadi, Iraq. One battalion was going home in a few days and the other just starting its seven month tour. Two Marines, Corporal Jonathan Yale and Lance Corporal Jordan Herter, 22 and 20 years old respectively. One from each battalion. They were assuming the watch together at the entrance gate to an outpost that contained a makeshift barracks housing 50 Marines. The same broken down ramshackle building was also home to 100 Iraqi police who are our allies. They were my men in this fight against the terrorists in Ramadi. Yale was a dirt poor mixed race kid from Virginia with a wife and a daughter and a mother and a sister who lived with him and he supported them as well on $13,000 a year. Herder was a middle-class white kid from Long Island. The two of them were from two completely different worlds in our country. Not good, not bad, just different. Had they not joined the Marine Corps, they would never have known each other. They would never have even understood that multiple Americas exist simultaneously, depending on your education level, your family's income status maybe. But they were Marines, they were combat Marines, and because of this bond, they were brothers as close as if they were born to the same woman. The mission orders they received from the sergeant, their squad leader, I'm sure went something like this, okay, you two clowns, stand this post and let no unauthorized personnel or vehicles pass. You clear on that? And I'm sure Yale and Herder then roll, Herder then rolled their eyes and said in unison something like, yes, yeah, Sergeant, we got it. We know what we're doing. Screw you. <laughs> Again, I'm prior enlisted. I know how they think. <laughs> they were then relieved, two, two other Marines on watch, who as it turned out were probably the two luckiest Marines on the, on the earth that day. And they assumed those posts, Yale and Herder, at, at a place called the Entry Control Point at Nasser in the Safiya district of uh, Ramadi in Iraq. In any event, a few minutes later, a very large blue truck turned down the, uh, the alleyway that was no more than 100 yards in length. It sped its way through the serpentine concrete walls, Jersey walls. The truck then stopped just short of where these two were posted. It detonated. It killed both of them catastrophically. And if you know what combat's like, you know what I'm talking about when I say catastrophically. 24 brick masonry houses were damaged or destroyed by the blast. A mosque 100 meters away collapsed. The truck's engine came to rest 200 meters away, and it knocked down a building before it came to rest. Our EOD guys, or explosive guys, reckoned that the blast was made by a bomb of at least 2,000 pounds of explosive. Two died, and because these two young infantrymen died, they didn't know how to run from danger. 150 men, 50 U.S. Marines and 100 Iraqis were saved. When I read the situation report, a few hours after it happened, I called the regimental commander, Lou Craparata, and I asked him for details about what happened. It seemed different to me. Unfortunately, Marines dying or being seriously wounded is common in, com in combat. We expect Marines, and for that matter, soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Coast Guardsmen, regardless of rank, to do their duty, to stand their ground, and to die, if that's what the mission requires. The regimental commander had just returned from the site. He agreed with me, for it reported to me that no American witnesses to the event that there were no American witnesses, just Iraqi police. I figured if there was any chance of finding out what actually happened and to recognize these young men for what they'd done, I'd have to go down there myself because I understood, unfortunately, that the bureaucrats in Washington would never accept Iraqi statements for what had taken place. If, it, if there was any chance at all, it had to come under my signature. So I traveled to Ramadi the next day and spoke to half a dozen Iraqi police 
all of whom told me the same story. They said the truck turned down into the alley and sped up as it made its way through the serpentine Jersey walls. They all said they knew immediately what was going on, particularly when the Marines began to fire. The Iraqis all began firing as well, then to a man ran for safety just prior to the explosion. They all survived. Many were injured, some seriously injured. But as one of the Iraqis said to me, sir, they'd run from the danger like any normal man would to save his life. What he didn't know until then, he said, and what he learned at that instant was that Americans are not normal. <laughs> With tears welling up, he said to me, sir, in the name of Allah, no sane man would have stood there and done what they did. No sane man. They saved all of us. What we didn't know at the time, what I didn't know at the time, and only learned a couple of days later, after I wrote a summary of statement of, these, of this bravery and submitted it, and submitted them, both Yale and Herder, for Navy Crosses, which is the number two award for Marines and sailors in combat. What I didn't know was that one of the security cameras we had at the location that was damaged initially in the blast had caught everything. And it happened exactly as these Iraqis described it to me. It took exactly six seconds by that recording from the truck entered the valley until it uh, exploded, six seconds. And you can watch, and I did watch many, many times on this recording, the last six seconds of their lives. When it first started, I suppose it took about a second or so for the Marines to separately come to the conclusion about what was going on. They had no time to talk it over only enough time to take half an instant and think about what the sergeant maybe had told them a few minutes before, let no unauthorized, unauthorized persons or vehicles to pass. At that point, I think, according to the recording, this Marine said, about five seconds to live. Think of it, five seconds to live. I don't think they knew it. They didn't have time. It took about another two seconds for the two jarheads, to raise their weapons, to take aim, and to open up at that truck. By this time, the truck was halfway through the barriers and gaining speed the whole time. Here, the recording shows a number of Iraqi policemen, some of whom had fired their AK-47s, were now scattering like the normal and rational men they were, some running right past the Marines. The two Marines had about three seconds to live. For about two seconds more, the recording shows the Marines firing their weapons nonstop. The truck's windshield exploded into shards of glass as their rounds took it apart and undoubtedly tore into the body of the terrorist that was trying to kill their brothers. Unaware of the danger at the time, the Marines and Iraqi soldiers could take comfort in the fact if they'd have known that two Marines were on watch and would die before they ran. The truck careens to a stop immediately in front of the two Marines. In all of this instantaneous violence, Yale and Her Herder never hesitated. They never stepped back. They never even started to step back. They never shifted their weight. With their feet spread shoulder width apart, they leaned into the fire and fired as fast as they could. They had only, at this point, one second to live. And then the truck explodes, the camera goes blank, and the two young men go to their God. Six seconds. Not enough time to think about their country, or their flag, or about their lives, or their deaths, but more than enough time for two very brave young men, like your sons and daughters, like your brothers and sisters, like your spouses, two very brave young men to do their duty 
for eternity. That is the kind of people who are on watch for us all over the world tonight. That is the kind of young men and women that came from your families. I end tonight by saying to you all that when future generations ask why America is still free in the heyday of these terrorists and their allies was counted in days rather than centuries as they said, as they proclaimed would work or would happen, that our hometown heroes, our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our coast guardsmen, our marines, that they can say because of me and people like me who risked all to protect millions, millions who will never know my name, that's why we still have an America. And for those of you tonight and all of the families who have lost the light of their lives, they can say to every American that it was my boy or it was my girl who stood their post and did their duty <clears throat> into eternity. <clears throat>